So next let us discuss about meconium ileus. Now in meconium ileus what happens there is basically collection of a thick paste like meconium in the terminal ileum. Now what it will do it will form a bolus and will cause obstruction of the terminal ileum. Now what happens in meconium ileus. It is basically collection of thick paste like meconium in the terminal ileum. And it leads to obstruction of terminal ileum clear now this meconium ileus it is seen in patients of cystic fibrosis and it has been found that it is associated with 15 percent patients with cystic fibrosis now what happens due to this obstruction the proximal ileum will be dilated whereas the distal ileum and colon they are collapsed so have a look how it happens suppose this is sending colon this is ileum now this will be the collection of meconium so as a result of it, the proximal bowel, it will be dilated, whereas the distal bowel, it is collapsed. So what happens? Here, the proximal ileum is dilated, whereas distal ileum and colon, they are narrow. Now, clear. now next important point is that sometimes what happens there can occur enormous dilatation of the proximal part of the ileum and perforation can occur and if this perforation occurs in new in intrauterine period so it can lead to intrauterine perforation peritonitis and this is termed as fecal meconium peritonitis but please remember that this fecal meconium peritonitis it is a sterile condition it is a sterile condition now next let us discuss the clinical features see the clinical features neonates they will present with features of intestinal obstruction so what will be the clinical features? The neonates will have features of intestinal, more specifically ileal obstruction. They may have respiratory dysfunction. And since it is associated with cystic fibrosis, so they may present with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So they may have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Now you know that in patients of cystic fibrosis, there is high salt content in the sweat. So in these patients also, if we see the salt content of the sweat, there will be high salt content in the sweat of these patients. So there will be high salt in the sweat and it has been found to be more than 90 millimoles per gram clear now let us discuss the diagnosis part now in the diagnosis the first investigation we will do will be x-ray abdomen now what we will find in the x-ray abdomen there will be calcified pellets of meconium in the distal ileum 
and also due to this there will be obstruction leading to multiple air fluid levels on x-ray abdomen so what we will find on x-ray there will be multiple calcified pellets in distal ileum leading to multiple air fluid levels and this type of appearance is termed as soap bubble appearance soap bubble appearance and also called as new hosier sign new hosier sign so it is called as so bubble appearance or new hosier sign now another important test for diagnosis is what we do we inject pilocarpine which is an cholinergic drug this drug is injected in the skin of the patients now we know that this pilocarpine it is a cholinergic drug now when we will inject this drug in the skin of the patients what it will cause it will stimulate the sweating in the skin and as a result what is done this sweat is collected and sodium and chloride levels they are analyzed in the sweat and it has been found that they are more than 90 millimoles so what is done when they are injected in the skin it will stimulate sweating and when the sweat is analyzed for sodium and chloride its levels have been found to be more than 90 millimoles clear next important test is what we do vomitus of these patients do not contain trypsin as a result if the vomitus is poured on exposed x-ray film what we will find it will not digest gelatin of x-ray so it means that the patient is suffering from meconium ileus as well as cystic fibrosis whereas in normal individuals the their pancreatic their uh, this vomitus it will contain trypsin as a result it will digest the gelatin of x-ray now let us discuss the treatment part now in the treatment first we have non-operative measures in non-operative measures what we do we do dissolution by gastrographin or tween 80 what we give in non-operative measures we give dissolution by anema using gastrographin and tween 80 so it will cause dissolution of the meconium pellets Another important drug which can be used is 10% N-acetylcysteine. Now how it is given? A per annual irrigation using N-acetylcysteine is given. What it will do? It also causes digestion of these meconium pellets. So next let us discuss the operative measures. Now operative measures. Now, please remember that the standard surgical approach is standard surgical approach is entrotomy with irrigation using warm normal saline. or 4% N-acetylcysteine now what it will cause then we will do 
complete evacuation of meconium pellets now first what we will do we will do an entrotomy then we will open the bobble wall after that we will do irrigation using n acetyl cysteine or warm saline after that what we will do we will remove the meconium pellets or another thing which we can do we can milk these meconium pellets into the large bowel so what we can do or these pellets they can be pushed down into large bowel manually and after that what is done closure of entrotomy is done after that closure of entrotomy is done now clear now what this n-acetylcysteine does it basically it breaks the disulfide bonds of the meconium as a result of which it does what it causes it separates these meconium from the bowel wall as well as it also decreases the clumping of these meconium pellets so next other methods let us discuss the other methods which are used for the treatment now if the condition of the patient is critical then there is an operation which we do it is termed as bishop coop operation so have a look if patient's condition is critical and if he is in obstruction then we go for bishop coop's operation bishop coop operation now in this bishop coop operation what we do in this operation suppose this is the large power in this the distal ileum will be taken out as ileostomy and the proximal portion will be anastomosed with this segment so if these are the pellets here meconium pellets what we go do we take out this distal segment as ileostomy out and the this proximal segment is anastomosed with this portion of the ileum and through this what we will do we will give irrigation with n acetyl cysteine and when we will give irrigation using n acetyl cysteine it will break down these meconium pellets so this is termed as bishop coop operation now next important is there is a one more operation which is termed as centuli operation termed as centuli operation now in this operation what we do have a look this is large bowel now in this the distal segment is anastomosed and the proximal segment is taken out as ileostomy so this distal segment will be anastomosed these are the pellets and this is taken out as proximal ileum taken out as ileostomy this is the anastomosis these are the pellets so here what we do here the proximal ileum it is brought out as ileostomy and through this ileostomy what we will do we will do irrigation and after that the distal ileum it is sutured to proximal ileum the distal ileum it is sutured to proximal ileum with an end to side anastomosis see it is end to side so end to side anastomosis is done okay now one question is asked in the exam which is the ideal procedure which can be done in a child of 
meconium ileus if the child's condition is very sick and he is in obstruction so the answer is you will do the resection and anastomosis we will resect that gangrenous portion of the bowel and we will anastomose the healthier segments so one question is asked in the exam that which is the ideal procedure in a child who is fit so the ideal procedure is resection and anastomosis so ideal procedure in a child who is fit is resection and anastomosis we will resect the gangrenous segment of the bowel and we will maintain the continuity by doing the anastomosis so this was all about the meconium ileus